But before we get started, make sure to leave a like and subscribe for more comic-related material and content just like this. Mark Grunewald was someone who resoundingly got comics. He started reading around the age of six and remained so until he entered junior high around 12 to 13. It was then that his mother suggested he show his maturity before entering junior high by getting rid of his collection, which he did. He sold around 300 comic books that he had been collecting since late 50s, early 60s for a whopping two comics for five cents. God, imagine if I could, you know, if only I had a time machine, I'd grow back and buy those comics from, from a 13 year old Mark Grunewald. But one year later, he was back in the habit and continued reading, albeit alone, because he says that none of his friends were into comics. You know, it's that age where you want to grow up, you want to be mature. And a little tangent is that there's a fantastic quote that I love by C.S. Lewis, which goes like this. When I became a man, I put away childish things, including the fear of childishness and the desire to be very grown up. And so Mark continued reading comics until he got to college, where he eventually found more people that were more open about their hobby, like him, and eventually he discovered the grandeur of comic conventions. In the late 70s, before he was hired by either Marvel or DC, Mark Grunewald was self-publishing his own fanzine titled Omniverse. Typically, fanzines featured anthology stories, correspondence between fans, uh, articles by fans, and just whatever certain medium or genre they were focusing on, it would more or less be stuff like that. You'd make pen pals, you would sell stuff to other people, you know, it was, it was chat rooms before chat rooms, it was uh, comic TikTok, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not hip. Here's a fun fact about fanzines, particularly those related to comics. The proto-Superman character first appeared in Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster's 1933 fanzine, Science Fiction. But Mark Grunewald, his fanzine was not like anything I just described. Omniverse was dedicated to continuity and the consistency between the 2D realities in which are held between 15 to 20 thin sheets of paper called comic books. He would later continue this in spirit when he was appointed as editor of the official handbook of the Marvel Universe. Welcome to Omniverse. The publication in your hands is like no other. It is the first magazine ever to be devoted solely to the exploration of fictional reality in its many depictions in contemporary literature. The word omniverse is used in my treatise on reality in comic literature to refer to the continuum of all universes, the space-time matrix that comprises all alternate realms of reality. Omniverse will examine comic books not as an art form, nor as a literature. Omniverse will treat comics as a medium of ideas, presenting speculations on phenomena, science, metaphysics, the whole gamut of reality, as is depicted in comics. Fictional reality is not a topic that a majority of comics and science fiction readers will be concerned with, for it deals with these literary forms not merely on the level of entertainment, but on the level of ideas. If you look for more in your comic, science fiction reading than a few minutes or hours of escapist pleasure, Omniverse is meant for you. And then he begins the issue with a discussion about Howard the Duck and funny animal cartoons. Also, Mark and his father, Myron Grunewald, co-wrote a, like, journal called A Primer of Reality in Comic Books in 1977. Mark had such an obsession with keeping record and track of continuity that he was nicknamed the Continuity Cop of Marvel. Uh, boy, that light is something. I'm the, uh, the caboose on this train of speakers, uh, so I'll keep it short and cover just what they left out. <laughs> no, actually, I'm going to talk about uh, the Marvel Universe. This is what makes Marvel different from all the other companies that are doing comics or 
trying to do comics or whatever. The Marvel Universe, what it is, is the coolest sandbox ever invented. It's it's a sandbox. It's it's something that Stan created. He's the architect, and he lets all the rest of us play in it. Uh, some people have calculated that there are more stories set in the Marvel Universe in this common backdrop than in any other fictional reality ever devised by any human being. I think that uh, there are at last count between 5,000 and 7,500 different stories set in this same place. So what do I do? I was, I was called the, the continuity cop. Well, <clears throat> uh, I keep track of things. Uh, that's why I do this book called the Official Handbook of the Marvel Universe. It's, it's like our encyclopedia. It's our way of keeping track of things. I'm the guy who, uh, well, if Stan is the architect of this sandbox, uh, Tom DeFalco, the editor-in-chief who spoke earlier, he's like the supervisor, and I'm the custodian. I got to sweep up all the messes and tell, oh, you, you can't uh, put your uh, sand there, and things like that. I, I'm the uh, custodian. What exactly I do is I keep track of what names are in use so that we don't get 13 destroyers. Right now we only have five. Uh, but we really only wanted one. Uh, what is real and what is not? Can we change what, what seems to have been established in the past or uh, can we preserve it? Frequently we will find that uh, discrepancies do creep in. I mean, we have, as I said, over a hundred different writers. Uh, try as they might, they're not telepathic. Uh, no one has necessarily read everything like I have uh, and so they don't know what what has uh, gone before so if they don't know it they're possibly doomed to negate it in some way or at least uh, not pay any attention to it and uh, our system of checks and balances is that I try to read most of the material as it goes out as the final continuity check uh, we have the word continuity it means something different than you do in film uh, it's just the sense of continuing a sense that the, the universe is uh, continuing to unfold in the same direction and it's not taking these weird non-continuous paths I like to think of it as consistency more than continuity so uh, what are some of the features of the Marvel Universe you may be asking yourself especially if you haven't read them uh, I asked myself that too, and that's why I have all these notes, because I can't remember. Well, first, they share a lot of features that are the same as our real world, or at least what our consensus real world might be if we had a consensus. For example, it's the same year in the Marvel Universe as it is this year. This is not set in the past, not set in the future. It's, it's now. It has the same cities, states, and countries in common with the city, states, and countries that we have in our real world. Not the case before Marvel came along. Before they would have fictional cities like Gotham City and Metropolis and wherever. All of our, uh, or most of our places are the same as in the real world. Is that we are trying to keep a balance, a very precarious balance, between not letting just the, the sheer number and amount of these things burden the reality in such a way that it's not believable. Because we believe that we have the most credible, the most character-wise believable fictional universe that has ever been devised. It's not only the biggest, but it's the most believable. So let me tell you, it's a full-time job trying to keep these things in line and not letting them affect consumer technology, not letting them affect religion, not letting them uh, affect everything. The way we do it, in a nutshell, is every time people see something amazing, they're surprised. That's all it is. It's, it's we, we let the people think that everything they see that's way, way, way out of the ordinary is anomalous, is, is uh, wonderful. So it's, it's like even in New York, and let me tell you, New Yorkers are, are pretty jaded. Even in New York, every single time Spider-Man swings by, they're amazed. They never saw anything like that. I did not know a man could do that, they say. And, and that's, how, that's how we keep the level of relatability into our universe, which as I said is a big universe, possibly the biggest universe ever invented by man. And, and that's why we try to keep the reader relatability by making all of these things as wonderful as they really are and not letting them permeate uh, the universe in such a way that uh, it becomes old hat and everybody has a uh, teleporter in their closet and you know a, a closet full of unstable molecule clothing. You, you can tell I do, but most people don't. It hasn't, 
hasn't come down to consumer technology. Uh, I would say that the existence of the Marvel Universe with all of its interrelated characters and its fantastic yet consistent elements is probably the reason why Marvel Comics has become and will remain for the foreseeable future until we mess it up big time uh, the top selling comic book company in the Western world. Walt Simonson in his Fantastic Four run made every member of the Time Variance Authority resemble Mark Grunewald, whom Owen Wilson also fairly resembles as Mobius in the show. Mark Grunewald was hired by Marvel Comics in 1978, and he would work there until his death 18 years later in 1996. He was initially hired as an assistant editor, and in 1982, he was promoted to editor where he took the reins of The Avengers, Captain America, Iron Man, Thor, Spider-Woman, and the What If series. But that's not all he did. He was also a fill-in penciler of just various issues whenever they would need it, but he specifically wrote and penciled all four issues of the 1983 Hawkeye miniseries. But aside from being a fantastic editor and mentor to future creators of the comic industry, Mark Grunewald is perhaps most well known as a writer specifically of the Captain America series. Uh, I had been doing symbolic characters, uh, characters, uh, villains that, uh, you know, don't just rob banks, but have some symbolic nature uh, to their actions. Flag Smasher, who represents anarchy and non-nationalism and uh, characters uh, of that ilk. And I realized that because Captain America was the good guy, mm -hmm. It seemed to be saying that patriotism had to be good because patriotism was Captain America and he was the good guy. And so I wanted to show the dark side of, of patriotism. So I invented the character Super Patriot to show that. And he eventually became Captain America because he's the Rambo version of, of Cap, also the, the more commercialized. He's, he's the American dream as most people think of it, which is, you know, come to America, make a lot of money and, you know, at the expense of others and, you know, you know, do whatever it takes to get ahead because, mm. you know, uh, I think that's their idea of the American dream, making money. And that's not uh, Steve Rogers' idea. Uh, he believes it's, you know, the uh, land of opportunity where you can be whatever you try to be. Mm -hmm. You know, so he's the ultimate self-made man. He doesn't, if, if what you want to be is a big money maker, all right, that's one thing. But, you know, that's that to me is the, the dark side of the American dream and of patriotism. Mark Grunewald still holds the record, I believe, as the longest writer on the series with 10 years on the title and 137 issues written. If Jack Kirby and Joe Simon were Captain America's parents, Mark Grunewald would be Captain America's cool uncle. Is this a silent picture or what? So far, no one's very funny today. Uh, if I could be funny, I wouldn't need to talk about it. Okay, this is what's known as musical chairs. Oh, no. Mr. Matt, you are here to be the crank up and the turn down kind of guy. Musical. Oh, these guys are going to walk out the music, suddenly cut, then they will sit down as quickly as they can. But for some reason, there is one less chair than there are people. That means somebody here is a loser. Somebody has a big L written on their forehead already. More than somebody's a loser. And we want to see who it'll be. All right? Walk in a circle. Counterclockwise, like your brains. Oh, we've got a loser. There's a loser born every moment. Let's see which one it is. Oh, another loser, a big L. Oh, middle size SDR. We got on your mark. Numbering last and you said somewhere else. Good mind. I also trust you. Touch it with your hands. If you drop it. On your mark, first person to consume the 
the whole thing. <laughs> big, big bites, boys. <laughs> Where's the balls on the floor? On your mark. Wait, hold it, hold it, hold it. Hold it. Everyone you can get. So you can go without laughing the longest. Don, get all the laughs out. You can laugh now. Laugh. Get all those laughs out. Alright, all the people who want to make him laugh, let's let's get up here in front here. This one is more like a line dance. I will put it right here in the middle. It will pass all the way from knee to knee to the outside. And then come back. Gotta come back. Right here. It's gotta come back. So you're all going to get it twice unless you're one of the end people. Get the last up. <laughs> okay, ready? Right, How about that last birthday party, Glenn? Ready to get it, Rob? Uh, go. Hey, Glenn. Am I your assistant? <laughs> hey. <laughs> hey, Glenn, when are we going to get married? Glenn, now you got to keep me in the loop. <laughs> Characters created by Mark during his time on Captain America include John Walker, aka US Agent, Battlestar, Crossbones, and Flag Smasher. Any of those sound familiar? Mark Grunewald continued his creative journey into comics throughout the 1980s and well into the 1990s, but his work would really culminate in his magnum opus released in 1985, a 12-issue maxi-series that follows a league, if you will, of diverse superheroes called the Squadron Supreme of America as they deal with a near-cataclysmic aftermath where the team decides that they themselves, the superheroes of this world, are the only option to rule it and keep everyone safe and in order. Sound familiar? Remember earlier when I said that a lot of his comics are from the early 60s? Guess which characters from a certain company were the highest sellers? But as an editor at Marvel, it was very unlikely that he would ever get the chance to actually write for the distinguished competition. And as Chris Robertson so eloquently put in an article he wrote on Mark Grunewald, In Squadron Supreme, he was given the opportunity to write the JLA, or near enough to count. But better still, he was able to write them in a way that DC Comics would never allow. He was allowed to change them 
and more than that, allow them to change the world around them. And this wouldn't be the first or last time that Mark Grunewald has done something like this. Uh, later in the late 80s, early 90s, he would write for Quasar at Marvel, a total of 60 issues where he essentially became Marvel's Green Lantern, and Mark even wrote stories in which Quasar teamed up with Makari of the Eternals, essentially creating his very own Flash and Green Lantern comics. And in that aforementioned Hawkeye miniseries, he gave Hawkeye and the newly reinvigorated Bobby Morse, aka Mockingbird, the Green Arrow, Black Canary relationship dynamic. I could go on and on about Mark Grunewald and all the stories and information I have regarding him just for making this video of his exceptional skill in just understanding the essentials of pure storytelling, of his humor and witticism, of his killer mustache, and I could still venture down this path of nostalgia for, for a man that I never knew. Recounting old stories to you, revisiting old photographs and videos, pretending that he's still around, making comics and keeping track of Marvel's continuity. But what is funny, that's what I really want to talk about. You see, it is my belief that funniness or humor, as it is sometimes called, is simply a nervous response to the recognition that like this plastic skull, someday we're all going to die. You see, we keep death away for one instant more by laughing. <laughs> but I don't want you to take my word for it. Let's go to the man on the street or avenue as the case may be and see what he or she thinks what humor is all about. <laughs> oh, he's such a cutie. But I'm not. And that is not a healthy way to remember someone as artistic and great as Mark Grunewald. Mark Grunewald died of a heart attack at the age of 42 on August 12th, 1996. And after his death, he was cremated and his ashes were mixed with the ink used to print the first trade paperback of Squadron Supreme. I don't think Mark would want us to focus on his death or even himself. He probably want us to focus on comics. He wanted to create a community of fun-loving comic readers who were all connected by their enjoyment of the medium, be it through monthly reading or extreme analysis. There are even stories of Mark at conventions with a, a camera recorder filming Marvel fans who would come up and getting them to recite comic panels as though they were singing opera. <laughs> so I'll end this section with a reading from one of Mark's editorial pieces, Mark's Remarks, from a comic in 1986. The point of all this? One, if you like comics, there's nothing wrong or immature about it, especially these days with such a broad range of comics to choose from. If people tell you otherwise, they probably haven't actually read a comic in a long time. Two, if you're the only person in your neighborhood who likes comics, don't worry. There are ways to meet others who like them too, especially if your town has a comic specialty shop. And if you can't find anyone who reads them that lives near you, well, at least you'll have the fun I had knowing you're unique. And hey, look where my interest got me. A great job at the world's best comics company. Mark Grew.